colonoscopy and ileoscopy. And we'll have a topic for a 30 minutes talk and 15 minutes discussion. So I request all the participants to post their questions in the chat box so we can take it up. And this is followed by Dr. Uh, Amit uh, Datta on uh, another interesting topic of uh, um, NBI, narrow and imaging chromoendoscopy. This is electronic chromoendoscopy, which is a very emerging and important area for uh, early diagnosis of neoplasm. And after this, I will uh, call upon Dr. Amit Datta. First, we will have Professor T.S. Chandrasekhar. Uh, thank Chandrasekhar. you, Dr. Matthew, for your kind words. And I must congratulate Professor Vusha. Despite she had recently some setback in health, she was so energetic to come back for this session. That shows his dedication in the academic program. And this is a combined effort of the three premier institutes of India. I must congratulate the organizers, apart from Dr. Vusha and the team, PGA, AMS, and SGPJ program. And what she is concentrating to the postgraduate, it will go in the long way in the learning process. Last year, I gave the same topic. She said I should give the same topic once more because it is so vital. And it is the not only really bread and butter and jam of any endoscopist. And colonoscopy, as Matthew Phillips said, may be very simple, may appear. But if you get into one perforation or one bleeding, you know the technique. The most important thing in colonoscopy is it is not that you're reaching the cecum. If you don't read the cecum, why you do not read the cecum, you have to know, then only you can progress further. It is not showing the endoscope and seeing the terminal ileum. In what are the ways you have gone through that? So what are the difficulties you had there? This is an important thing. I bring warm greetings from Chennai to uh, the dear postgraduates. Now, this is going to be a three-dimensional approach. First, I'll give you some text material which will really highlight the importance of colonoscopic procedure. As Matthew Flip rightly said, uh, it may be before starting the procedure, in USA, above, anyone above 50, years of old, they should undergo colonoscopy because of the cancer surveillance program. It will not be very far off uh, in thinking about Indian scenario. In the last two years of COVID epidemic, we have seen people coming very late. And I was surprised to tell you that we had identified almost 10 cases of total colonic obstruction uh, because of the colon growth. That means we need to really gear, gear up with the colonoscopy technique and to go for the cancer service, I mean, cancer surveillance. The clip art I'm going to show you, the, some diagrammatic, uh, the cartoon, how to explain the various tips and uh, tricks, and certain videos which you have really taken during our workshop, I want to highlight with the three-dimensional approach, I think we'll be able to uh, tell you the tips and tricks of the colonoscopy procedure. It is not a run of the mill lecture, Okay, routine lecture where I can just copy something and then. So what I have designed, what all I found it very important for the postgraduate, you may call it as a pearls of experience. Okay, first of all, you should know the anatomy, rectum, and rectosigmoid. There can be yet a trouble in entering into the sigmoid. Sigmoid and descending colon, there can be a trouble. Splenic flexor into the transverse colon from the mid transverse colon going towards the, the proximal colon and hepatic flexor, cecum, terminal ileum, ileocecal valve, everything colonoscopy essential. Even though the name sounds large and interesting, please remember this is a thin walled structure. Perforation can happen. The other thing we have to know is mesocolon of sigmoid and transverse colon is quite variable in length. That complicates the problem of various loops like uh, the alpha loop and the gamma loop and other thing. And the persistence of mesocolon. Again, normally the, the descending colon and ascending colon is a retroperitoneal structure. But if the congenitally uh, have the colon, then you can have a reverse alpha and other reverse splenic flexor and so many things like that. 
So you will be wondering why we should know about loops and areas, various bend and maneuvers. My aim is just to read the CCAM. I am always uh, done with the eighty percent of the cases. I am not bothered about twenty. No. Now it has made it very very clear. American Society of GI Endoscopy and all over the world. Once you document the CCAM, you have to in fecal intubation picture has to be there, and terminal ileal picture has to be there. And ileocecal valve. The other other important thing is withdrawal time. What is withdrawal time is from cecum to the rectum. Your withdrawal time should be calculated at least not less than seven minutes, so that you are not missing any polyp or any structure. Okay. Now there are do's and don'ts. I follow certain rules. Very very stringent in inflating the colon with the air. The more you inflate, you are the, the sigmoid is so descended. You will be only in the sigmoid column. And you'll be thinking that you are uh, doing for the procedure, the procedure for 30 minutes, but nothing happened. You are in the sigmoid colon. Suction is the key for success. Very important is the more you suck and uh, collapse the colon, then you'll be able to uh, proceed further. Withdraw the scope even you cannot see the lumen. That is a very very important thing. Many people think that if you withdraw that you will fall down and you are losing the length. No, if you withdraw the scope, <laughs> you cannot see the lumen. And another important thing is one is to uh, one is to one push. Very important to know that. Here is if you push one centimeter, you should progress one centimeter. That is called one is to push. Sometimes what happens? You keep on pushing and shoving the endoscope from the anal road, and you will be not you'll be seeing the progress. You are not going ahead with the transverse colon or sigmoid colon or the. Then that means the mechanical transmission scope is very important. Understand the formation of various loops. But I am very bothered about loops and maneuvers. I don't want to understand. But if you do not understand why you are failing in some cases, then you will not be able to proceed further. Moreover, understanding the loops and maneuvers will help you really to shorten the scope and reach the cecum in the shortest time possible. There is one technique I want to be very careful. You should not be very rude. The sliding technique, the scope slide along the wall. You are not seeing the lumen. The teaching is you see the lumen and proceed. Sometimes you are not able to do that, and along the wall without the blanching the mucosal vasculature, and here the lumen is not seen. That is called a sliding technique. I would uh, request that you should learn it uh, when you uh, get the expertise. Learn to shorten the scope. You are uh, one meter and forty centimeter in the cecum. You can bring it to seven centimeter. That is the ideal uh, length where you are able to see the cecum. Anal fissure don't proceed. It's painful. Actually, then you treat the anal fissure or lubricate the nicely. And whoever over the owner of the scope, please, or in the workshop also, don't unnecessarily twist the scope to the maximum so that you can break the thing. No, twisting the scope will not help you beyond certain level. And don't forget to do the J maneuver as you do it in GI uh, upper GI endoscopy in rectum to look for lower rectal. Sometimes, many times. You miss it. In fact, my surgeon insists. I also insist to my colleagues and postgraduate. After doing a nice proctoscopy, also very important to pick up the lower rectal region. If you are not able to do the JM, and sometimes JM maneuver may be difficult in a therapeutic colonoscopy, then you don't want to spoil that. So better do a proctoscopy. It's also part of the colonoscopic colon examination. And we try to identify through the transabdominal light transmission that is wrong actually. The cecum should be identified the convergence of tinea pulley and appendicular lumen and ileocecal valve. Once I remember that the patient, my colleague, uh, the the postgraduate had a distended sigmoid colon, so the light illumination was seen in the right iliac fossa. He was thinking that he had reached the cecum. That is not the day to know that. So you have to see the anatomical landmark and do that. And many people reported past up to 30 centimeter, 40 centimeter. That does not mean anything. 60 centimeter can be at cecum, and 60 centimeter at sigmoid too. Once I introduced the withdrawal time in our unit, a junior most postgraduate said that sir, he waited for seven minutes at cecum, then quickly withdrew the scope. That is not the withdrawal time. You have to be centimeter centimeter. But I tell them one more, one step ahead. You have to scan the colon millimeter by millimeter. Not to miss a polyp. In phase, in case if you miss a polyp in the cecum, and two three years later you develops a colon cancer, you demonstrate 
there can be a legal issue also in abstu ga bleed and low ag bleed never ever forget to go into the terminal ileum you can be a lesion there or maybe blood coming from there the tight ileocecal valve the blood may not be coming to the cecum but it be the terminal ileum that will be a clue that where is the abstu ga bleeding sources pustoscope very slowly and steadily and pull it watchfully and carefully that is again very important about this okay now coming to the alpha loop it is due to the lengthy sigmoid mesocolon you try to understand why some people develop alpha loop some may not do that and reverse alpha loop and the reverse splenic flexor is due to the persistence of descending mesocolon and i have seen cases the rarely not very frequently gamma loop due to lengthy transverse mesocolon to understand that i really had to take lot of efforts to read it and now i can make out why i can even undo the gamma loop also very clearly and alpha loop reverse alpha loop beware of the lengthy colons and complicated and indians or indian women particularly i don't know why the reason they have a long uh, colon sometimes because maybe you vegetarian or and maybe long colon so you'll be taking more time and beware of lower abdominal surgery cesarean hysterectomy etc pose challenge to perform colonoscopy having said about that never compromise on adequate preparation i am not going to the details of the preparation and make sure that cardiac state is all right the reason is you are dilating the colon vagus stimulation bradycardia may be there i you will be very enthusiastically doing colonoscopy to read the cecum and patient may be perspiring sweating and falling so uh, saturation and they develop infarction also in fact the beginning of my career i don't know whether matthew i told you i used to keep a mirror because you are the back the side, i mean you are not seeing the face of the patient so you are doing more concentrating in the bottom and uh, pushing the endoscope so i used to keep a mirror to see the face of the patient so that he is sweating or not how is the reacting to the pain and other thing very important and don't over sedate it the patient may not be able to appreciate the over distended colon these are the very important thing inadequate preparation more ear insufflation and more difficult procedure the work rule is simple push you are not able to proceed withdraw and push and you can try sliding the technique called it a hard push undo the loops uh, abdominal pressure change of axis of the endoscopy shaft or change of patient position all these thing work over and over a period of years of doing it several uh, at least minimum 250 colonoscopy must do that and make sure that you don't complicate the bleeding perforation perforation can be small hematoma in the anti mesenteric border or mesenteric border anti mesenteric perforation and um, if we see very unusual structure then you are perforated you have to be very careful sudden saturation other thing what is the clip r the right hand control the shaft you now very clearly and the left hand controls the wheels this is what the right hand i think most of them are right handed and the scope is in a straight standing position you don't go on towards the anus and start looking at it then you will be infected and yourself is very important there is a slight incidence of tuberculosis among the the colonoscopies i found it in uh, in local area of uh, chennai so i don't know the reason but uh, make sure that you are little away from the anus and be straight the first sigmoid bend is around 15 cm from the anal verge you as much as possible as quickly as possible you cross the 15 cm the well begun uh, the uh, well done if you start the procedure first like that without getting into the loop then you are very successful the scope passes anteriorly into the sigmoid colon just visualize like that and the sigma loop is restricted by the hand pressure if you want that i rarely use it because i don't inflate it colon so much till i reach sigma colon and descending colon i will be very very careful in inflating the air and fixed acute angle at sigma and descending colon this is a very very important this is the area of major area of perforation you know why sigma is a moving organ like a missile colon you have that and uh, descending colon is a fixed one retroperitoneal when you are uh, moving from the fixed one you are going there bound to be something so how to overcome this mostly this is the uh, very important area of negotiation the acute angle at the level of sigmoid and descending colon junction is decided by the 
I am not really going to go into the why it is like that mesentery and extent of retroperitoneal fixation. I have analyzed it. It is written in the book. The tip of the scope passed into the entry of the descending column, pull back. This is the way you, you pull back, you uh, come out, then you will try to enter it. Very simple because you are sorting something. You can take the advantage of the alpha loop. You keep pushing it, and uh, then the acute angle between from the sigmoid and descending colon disappears on this one. And counterclockwise rotation of the shaft of the scope alpha loop is formed. This is a very important thing. Rotation of the shaft of the scope alpha loop is formed. So what you do is you have to move the clockwise and anti-clockwise rotation, and accordingly you do that, and you form the this one alpha loop a beneficial iatrogenic valve in case of acute sigmoid and descending colon junction. You for that you want you want to understand for a beginner you have to read read thoroughly internalize understand for any endoscopy procedure you have to internalize. After that, uh, conscious learning it becomes an unconscious learning. Alpha loop is straightened by clockwise rotation and worsened by anticlockwise. How do you know that? This is what you have to know that. The sigmoid mesocolon coming anteriorly, sigmoid then going posteriorly, all these things you have to know that. And view of the alpha loop from front, view of the alpha loop in the shaft will advance in the scope, keep sigmoid colon straight and deeper insertion into the descending colon. This is a fantastic way to enter into the descending colon. And then you get dis, dis I mean, impacted at the level of screening flexor. So, what you have to do that. And whatever bending the scope, you have to straighten it. The impaction will disappear, then you enter into the transverse colon. Suction followed by pulling back the scope improves the view at the acute bend. This is a very important step. Suction, suction is the key. You have to know that. Compression by hand or sandbag. I never tried in my 35 years of practice sandbag because I am very, very careful about the inflate in the colon. Maximum we have done with the hand, but Sandbag is not a bad idea if you don't have someone to uh, help you with the compressing, uh, the hand compression. Tunnel view of the descending, ascending colon at hepatic flexor and straightening the colon possibly by pulling back. Pull back, you will succeed. You always be humble, you will succeed. Your withdrawal will also help you to succeed. And after that aspiration, yeah, the hepatic flexor towards that, again, you are sucking the air, your aspiration of air and fluid at the ascending column helps you to reach the cecum. And measurement at various anatomical uh, landmarks if the scope is in the cecum, this is what the measurement, you will see that very clearly 50 centimeter, 80 centimeter, 70 and 20 centimeter. And within four to five centimeter from the cecum, blind end, you have the terminal ilium. And ileocecal valve is approximately, you have to know that, Go past the ileocecal valve, and what you have to do it, you can uh, do it in the left lateral position or supine position. I'll teach you in a supine position very easy. And uh, how will you turn it? And this is what the videos I'm going to show you there. This is showing the rectal valve. You have to know count three valves. If you cross the rectal valve, you are entering into the sigmoid colon. So try to enter into the sigmoid without inflating the air. This is the very important. I'm using fluoroscopy as a teaching CD. We have created 14 teaching CD ROMs in various uh, endoscopy techniques. Those postgraduate who want a colonoscopy teaching CD, we have one basic in advance. They can write to me, I can send it to them, or I can send it to Professor Vusa. She can distribute it uh, to all the postgraduate. I'll be very delighted to do so. So this is what I want to tell you about rectal valve. And the final rectal wall, now you are entering to the sigmoid colon. Okay. And this is again to show you that the moment you reach the sigmoid colon, don't inflate air. I'm going to show you here the point, finger pointing sign. What do you mean finger point? I do not put my finger into the suction at all. I mean the uh, air water. So, so if you inflate air, what happens? Again, you get bloated and get lost. You get the uh, whole scope, get... Uh, finished within that uh, sigma and descending colony itself. So this is a very important thing, uh, pointing finger sign. This is what I always tell my postgraduate. Like that, I want to tell you that various steps we have discussed in our teaching CD. And this is just to show you the, how the, uh, the endoscopy procedure 
and you don't need to do fluoroscopy routinely in the i have done it for the sake of teaching otherwise you don't need that now the teaching aid is also well this is just to show the how the alpha loop either you can exaggerate the alpha loop enter into the descending colon this is the retroperitoneal to close the spine descending or you can undo the alpha loop and you can enter into that so you do the clockwise rotation you can undo there are two ways of doing the colonal alpha loop reduction and entry into this again this is just to show that how uh, i we are teaching cd where we have that the scope external movement and the fluoroscopy and we are entering trying to enter from sigmoid to the uh, transverse colon i want to show you the bluish discoloration which is very typical of splenic and the and this is the blue bluish discoloration of the venous plexuses uh, uh, overlying the colon mucosa and this is what it is now okay now various uh, uh, colonoscopy videos we have taken in is just show the how to identify the cecum now i'll tell you the ways to enter into the terminal ileum and you go past the ileocecal valve and withdraw it and tend to the left towards the um, five o'clock or seven o'clock position the terminal ileum you have to know that you can enter into that i'll show you one more video how you can enter into the terminal ileum so there is endless way of uh, teaching aids are available only thing you have to master it so this is the ileocecal valve to show that upper two lips of the ileocecal valve this is to demonstrate the the j maneuver in the rectum and how we do this j maneuver but very careful you have to inflate the rectum nicely if the rectum is not inflated it may damage the endoscope this is what again now finally there are several advances happen endocoffision water filling colonoscopy third eye colonoscopy where when you want to uh, uh, see in advance when you are withdrawing the scope you have a third eye and artificial intelligence i will not go into the detail because of my the the scope of my talk is only well, tips and tricks in colonoscopy procedure the water filling if you have a spasm or you are not able to see there some mild narrowing is there because spasm you can fill up the water uh, this is the water for prevention of barrow trauma and i have taken this uh, courtesy from dr douglas rest president of in uh, american society of ga endoscopy and i have taken video from him also with his permission and this is the endocoff vision because the polyp is a major problem in usa colon cancer it is not a major issue but slowly we are also seeing now we started using this kind of technique to identify not even miss one polyp again you have to be excellent when I mean, you have to be excellent in your technology for that you need to have a very good preparation and you have a satisfactory examination of the colon from terminal ileum to uh, the rectum very important to do that and don't forget to uh, see the lower rectum with the proctoscopy also and uh, in conclusion the stages of competence i always tell this whether you are going to learn upper ga or you are going to learn the colonoscopy unconscious incompetence first you will be wondering will be worried about whether you will be able to reach the cecum or terminal ileum and uh, you don't know that you don't know conscious competence incompetence will come now you know what you don't know then conscious competence it may appear more difficult than colonoscopy but this is what everyone will go that you know what you know consciously very important this is and unconscious competence you know what you know subconsciously so like driving a car you will never know that when do you apply when did you apply brake when did you uh, ax uh, the uh, the use the accelerator when you do turn left to right or everything that becomes so subconsciously you will be called as a master two things start doing it subconsciously without any complication or complication uh, acceptable range of international standard and beneficial to the patient and uh, i used to wonder the doctors keep on my colleagues uh, in, uh, in rotary club they ask me why you doctor keep on learning and all today's trainee is tomorrow's trainer and today's trainer may be tomorrow's patient so teach everyone for the benefit of everybody this is what i used to tell them so because 
life is very precious we need to have the most technically sound person who can do a very ethical job this is what i think uh, just 30 minutes now i made it the tips and tricks of colonoscopy three dimensional approach with the what i have done is how will you do the clip art and videos and the text and uh, colonoscopy don't take it very lightly the reason is the reason why we is not take it you don't know what is ahead of the tip of the endoscope whether it's going to be a bend or the loop or a stricture or a lesion and or a normal colon so you have to blindly proceed but you have to proceed intelligently and where you are you where you are at the level of the colon you have to know very clearly and without inflating looking at the face of the patient that is so is not sweating not abdominal distension is not there and there is no hemodynamic compromises at the same time i will never agree to do a colonoscopy without sedation however patient is willing or however patient is denying i will explain to them the reason is some people tolerate very well but mostly they do not tolerate the colon the intolerance i mean the colon distension nowadays in our unit we start using carbon dioxide in case because ours the training center in mishap happens and we quickly we know that carbon dioxide is absorbed better than particularly if there is a therapeutic procedure particularly we know that colonoscopy done elsewhere and they come for second opinion to uh, do the procedure to complete the procedure other important and if you despite all the thing you call your senior if you are not able to proceed further and very important when you have a very severe colitis or there is a diverticulosis where you are not able to negotiate you please call the senior whether it's worth the proceeding or not and you have a friable growth and be very careful in uh, uh, so keeping the i mean you are uh, progressing the across the friable growth suddenly you will see the lumen of the, i mean you enter into the peritoneum so you have to be very very careful despite all these measures you are not able to complete the colonoscopy you are not able to enter the terminal ileum you please make a point i am not able to go beyond this because of this reason and i am not able to see this uh, get into the terminal ileum because of this reason. if you make it then the report will have value and you have to write a very nice detailed report it's not like past of this sickdom everything normal i am normal he is normal that should not be the report also and should be returned in a very proper format what all you looked into that you should make a mention how are the mucosa vasculature any granularity even the negative points also you have to write no granularity uh, no stricture no pseudo i mean all these things should be instead of writing normal colonoscopy does not convey any meaning at all so with this i just uh, i will be happy to take up some question at the end of the session and this is what the uh, my talk about colonoscopy tips and tricks and please read the peter cotton book at least 10 times the beginner when you join the uh, dm post graduate depend the post graduation read 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 thoroughly try to internalize what is alpha loop what is reverse alpha what is reverse sigmoid what is gamma and what are the thing many people will discourage you don't have to know anything just keep pushing the scope you will read that that concept i will not like it i will not approve it i will not advocate it the reason is how do you learn swimming no you get into the swimming pool you will learn sometime you will do it very well no you have a proper mentor and guru you will be very successful most important if you are not successful you should know why you could not complete the colonoscopy thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity thank you tsc for this wonderful masterly talk and you have shown us that the combination at in teaching combination of uh, uh, diagrams and uh, videos and uh, legends and all these things are quite uh, important and you have utilized all the three different uh, 3d what you told is 3d you know i think the three uh, dimensional type of teaching it was excellent i we, we all liked it so well and uh, i also learned a lot and your concept of just pushing the scope it will go into sicum it may be true for tsc not for all no in tsc just push it will go to sicum not for everyone i agree with that and uh, there is a question that uh, regarding that you have told us that sedate you sedate all your patients 
So yeah, one question is that uh, will you select your patients for uh, sedation? In, not in your case. Another is, you know, is there really any difference between sedated and non-sedated, which is better? And what is the ideal drug for sedation? This question is by Dr. Pradeep Nigam. Okay. The sedation, why I choose is, if you need to have a cancer surveillance, you need to do repeated colonoscopy for a procedure. That's an indication you should come back to you. So suppose you are doing the uh, APC for the proctitis and other thing. You should not feel that uh, you are... Uh, and first colonoscopy should not be very painful. Number one, you are planning for a therapeutic procedure, you should do that. And if you have a cardiac uh, issues there, you have a proper anesthetist with you and sedate it. And young patient, otherwise you are expecting a normal colonoscopy, he is brave enough to agree for that. Then uh, the, actually there is no criteria where whom to be sedated. But most of the center, they sedate the colonoscope. And the first 100 cases by a, a beginner, the patient should be sedated because he can do a proper exam. Otherwise, the patient shouting, he's shouting, the nurse is shouting, and he's jumping. And that should the scenario should not be there. And the next room doctor will be asking what is happening and all. Are you doing colonoscopy? That kind of thing should not happen. And people earn a bad name for the procedure also. And doctor, you do anything but for that colonoscopy. The doctor really did the bad thing. I think that the kind of fear among the public also can be avoided. Agreed. Uh, TSC agreed. <clears throat> I think, you know, the most important thing is the patient, uh, uh, <clears throat> the patient should be comfortable. If you want to do a proper colonoscopy, the patient should be quiet and patient is comfortable and patient is looked after. So in the same context, can we ask a question? In which patients will you do an IV anesthesia or an anesthesia procedure instead of sedation? Whom will, you, whom will you use anesthesia? Okay, okay. That's a very good question. Actually, what we do is, uh, there are sedation without anesthetic, sedation, uh, our, we can do it ourselves with our nurses, trained nurses and doctors. So these are the people, young people who will tolerate no comorbid disease and we want to do a diagnostic colonoscopy. Only we do that and we use the uh, the uh, uh, pentagosine and the other uh, medicine mepridine we use it. But those who need to undergo a major procedure or comorbid disease, we'll have the anesthetics where we'll have the propofol, uh, this one. And you don't need a general anesthesia naturally. So this is how we do it. Not all patients you need an anesthetic. The reason is anesthetic may not be available sometime. Then you have to wait for them, it prolong the procedure. So I will not advocate that. And you have to select it according to the age, comorbid disease, and the past experience of not cooperative. All these things can come into the propofol. So other things you can do it. Your own safe sedation is possible. But only thing I advise them to have the good monitoring with the saturation and the pulse oximetry. And the, I would love to have the ECG monitor. Also, this is easily possible that. And I will not agree with that. Those who are sedated will consume more time shifting the patient, other time and all. I think you need to have one or two tables extra and you have to do that. Uh, then only that will be very useful. Just because lack of time, lack of manpower, lack of uh, your uh, space to shift and all, I, that will not be a criteria not to select a sedation. Thank you, TSC. In other words, you want to say that anesthesia is given to those patients who are uncooperative, patient who has got uh, uh, significant comorbidities where the anesthetist is necessary and rather you have no time to look at that. Or when you do a major therapeutic procedure which take time or pay, the procedure is painful. Agreed. And another question is, you know, <clears throat> it is that, that uh, how well you assess a patient or is patient is prepared or not? Or, yeah, that's a very good question, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once what happened, we called anesthetist, everything done, and he was also busy. Anesthetist he came and everything. We just entered the thing uh, full of, uh, I mean, the uh, colon was totally unprepared in the sense. So we had to, we are already given sedation. And other things. So one thing is a one rectal examination will help you. Uh, double dose preparation. The previous night, I we found it very useful. Previous night preparation of and next day morning preparation, around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, they are very fine to undergo the procedure. One is the concept of preparation. Number two is you have to questionnaire, you have to ask that. Everyone will say that they want in haste, they will say, oh, everything done uh, uh, is coming and all. So we ask clearly, 
what is a liquid or semi solid number 1 number 2 what was the color of the object so the questionnaire will help you this has been reported in various uh, journals also the questionnaire will the, the color of the effluent uh, and the the what is the state is uh, if it is a liquid and a colorless then we agree with it so Another that is the one number 2 number 3 i do a rectal examination before sedation if the finger stall is very clear then these are the three ways and you have your own way matthew yes no no i think the most important thing is that when you give an anesthesia to a patient and you find that the colon is unprepared then makes a problem so you should have and another small advice i mean the suggestion either before giving anesthesia i'll ask my uh, colleague uh, to just do a sigma just to enter into the rectum and see if that rectum itself is very bad then i will tell my anesthetist i think we'll prepare it a little better and we can postpone the procedure i i think the most important thing is looking at the stool sample and that is the most important thing you know if they can show that is that is what we follow and one more thing that uh, at the same context and tc uh, that you very brief in your answers because there are so many questions and we have no time now left and another is a patient with ckv or when there is a patient is taken up for an emergency colonoscopy how what will be your advice on preparation emergency colonoscopy we do it in gi bleed only you have to learn to do it i just do the uh, only the the enema and i proceed to do that and my aim is just to look at the bleeding list number 1 and uh, number 2 then we don't use the phosphate uh, containing all this thing for the ckd uh, we get the approval from the nephrologist and go ahead accordingly and all preparation should not be used indiscriminately for all patient and we select a patient and uh, be careful with the manager i mean nowadays no one is using manitol that is out of question now when we were students i just want to tell you in the lighter sense how did we prepare in 1980 uh, we used to put a rail tube and hang it 5 liters of water total gas total colon total intestinal lavage and we we as a resident we have to look at the bottom of the thing what is the container and the water here and the water there is equal mean dr jbd will agree for colonoscopy <laughs> it was at the time now it is totally changed now you can guess my age also now because telling this incident in 1980 <laughs> okay 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 yes uh, no there is no change in your personality you know that we have seen the video of 20 years old you are looking same handsome as the same one now there is no change but anyway uh, we have another question is that uh, how do you change your is there in need of changing the position of the patient while you negotiate bends okay and that is a very good question I am done with the, all these slight uh, slight push technique that the final one, and I am not able to proceed. I try to shorten if not possible, then I'll change the position. Not I routinely I don't change the position. And for terminal ileum, sometimes I change the position of the patient from uh, left lateral to supine. So change of position is only you are done with the other techniques, and then only. It is very difficult to change the position when the patient is sedated, particularly. obese patient you need to have someone to help you so change of position is advised when you are done with the other techniques and not possible then only i change the position in other words uh, supain is better for ileoscopy no that's what yeah, you i can understand the anatomy better that, huh? <clears throat> and uh, on my last thing you know because there were no time you have told us how to do colonoscopy you have told us many things on colonoscopy you have shown us different techniques and but for a postgraduate student what do you think the learning curve for colonoscopy and how you should learn is it on models or watching and or starting under supervision okay this is combination of all three first reading read the book read 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 watch the video 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 then uh, if you have a module available teaching module available you go into that and see the color atlas to know the what is the thing so books video module and the atlas then observe the mentor how is he doing it most important is selection of patient and all this thing you have to be very good after that he knows that indication and contraindication and watching the procedure then i in our unit what do is for the beginner we don't give the colonoscopy straight away we give them in the cecum let him learn to withdraw the scope so that you will see the lumen and i'll tell them keep the lumen in the center and withdraw the scope i hope uh, usha also must be doing the same thing or everyone should do and uh, see come you give that and they will draw the scope nicely they get a hand eye coordination 
then I give from rectum to sigmoid. And sigmoid, I'll be very careful, supervising whether he's not able to, I will help him. Then I will hand over the scope again to him, descending colon. So this kind of mentorship, if you have that, we have a fantastic uh, uh, way of uh, preparing himself for the colonoscope. Thank you, TSC. It was a masterly talk. And I think what you told in the last is very, very important for post-year students to start with, uh, who are starting with colonoscopy. What I do is I give them the cecum, ask them to withdraw. And see. But you have to watch there because, you know, polyps should not be missed. So the, the mentor should stand there and see that how he's withdrawing and that is the, that he will get a hand-eye coordination really well. So I agree with that and it was a wonderful talk. We all learned a lot and even I'm an old man, I learned a lot from your talk. And uh, so... Uh, you're not an old man, you are very young in heart <laughs> learning, number one. Number two, our final statement I want to make here is Please do not underestimate colonoscopy procedure, yes, number yes, one. Yes. If you prefer it, you, uh, if you are either lose the patient, if you want to save the patient, it costs you uh, almost to the tune of two lakhs. As yes, a one-stage procedure or two-stage procedure, so you have to be very careful. Especially if the poorly, if it is a poorly prepared colon, it is going to be a big mess. So I th thank uh, Dr. TSC for this wonderful talk. It was really good. And Usha wants to say something? No, yeah, I just wanted to re-emphasize to all the postgraduates that apart from preparing the patient, you have to prepare yourself before you do the procedure. And mm -hmm. what Dr. Chandrasekhar has highlighted, such key points in your learning process. So please read and see videos and learn from withdrawal and then learn to insert the colonoscope mm -hmm. and suction is key in colonoscopy. So, and eventually everybody will learn. So there is no need on a particular day to say that I reached the terminal ileum. There is no need. It is a staged procedure. And if you learn in a structured way, you can learn better. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar for an excellent talk. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I think with, with the permission of panelists, I would like to make a quick announcement for the postgraduate. Uh, so, there are mainly two announcements. First, please uh, note these things uh, that it, at the end of each session, we will have a quiz of which comprising of five questions which are relevant to that day's topic. And all the postgraduates are supposed to answer this question, five questions. And three winner, winners will be uh, declared based on the accumulated scores of 12 sessions at the end of the entire program that is in December 2022. Moreover, all the postgraduates who have attended 80% of the sessions, that means 10 sessions out of 12 sessions, and who has attended, who have attended uh, more than 50 questions out of 60 questions, will also uh, receive a course completion certificate. So this is very important announcement for the postgraduates. So please attend the entire session and try to attend the questions as well because three winners will get exciting academic uh, prizes. Thank you. Uh, uh, hand over to uh, chairpersons. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I think uh, we will move to the next uh, talk that is by Professor Amit Datta. He's uh, from CMC Vellu. And he's going to discuss on some very pertinent uh, topic, and it is a topic of uh, current interest. And I'm sure that almost everybody doing endoscopy and colonoscopy are doing these uh, techniques of uh, image enhancing techniques, whether it is chromoendoscopy or electronic chromoendoscopy or different types of uh, image enhancing techniques. And now we know that we have got uh, uh, newer technologies uh, like uh, endocytoscopy, um, uh, so many other new things are there. But to know, to know about NBI, which is a very relevant topic. We have um, Professor Amit Kumar Datta uh, from Gastronology Department of CMC Vellur going to discuss on that. And uh, he is a very well-known figure in this field and he doesn't require any introduction on that. And he, he is in the field of uh, Asian um, uh, endoscopy and uh, he is actually uh, a very important member of uh, a teaching faculty of uh, narrowband imaging. And I am sure... He is going to tell us from the very basics how to learn NBA for the postgraduate students. So, can I request uh, Professor Amit Datta to give us this lecture? Thank you so much. So, thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. Is my slide visible, sir? In the slide, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, thank you, sir. So, first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Usha Datta and the organizing team for giving this opportunity to me to make this presentation. So, I'll be speaking on the clinical applications of uh, narrowband imaging. So before I move on to the 
clinical applications, a few words about narrowband imaging in general because it's a postgraduate uh, program, and some and some people may not have you know have an idea about this technology. So essentially, narrowband imaging is a form of image enhanced endoscopy. So when we say image enhancement, what we mean is that we want to enhance the image which we are seeing so that we can see more details of the mucosal surface, actually, so that you can see things in much more detail and pick up an early lesion. Now, narrowband imaging, what happens in narrowband imaging is that instead of a white light, there is a filter which filters out two narrow wavelengths of light, one in the blue region, one in the green region. And so the image is obtained by these two wavelengths of light, and that's why it's called narrowband imaging. And along with the narrow wavelength of light, this technology also uses a high definition television, which improves resolution, and the images are magnified. So as a combination of this all three property, the narrow wavelength of light, the high definition television, and magnification, you see an image which is really enhanced. So as you can see in this picture, you can see the relatively flat appearing mucosa of godnum on white light. But when you use NBI, you can start seeing the villa, you can start seeing the vessels inside the villa. So that's what uh, narrowband imaging is. It's a form of image enhanced endoscopy. So this slide shows a snapshot of how different part of GI tract appear in NBI. This is the esophagus, the Z line, the stomach, the body of the stomach, antrum, this is the villi in the dodenum and the colon. So straight away, we can appreciate how different these parts of GI tract appear on a narrowband imaging compared to what we are used to seeing on a white light endoscopy. So therefore, for us to use this technology in our practice, we need to know how different part of it appears in NBI, and then we'll be able to appreciate any abnormality in that area. So therefore, we should be familiar with how patterns are in different part of the GI tract. So the two very important things which we are assessing when we're doing narrowband imaging is called the vascular pattern or the microvasculature and the surface pattern. So these are two essential components which I'll be talking repeatedly in my presentation. So when you're describing or when you're identifying a lesion on NPI, you're looking at the vascular pattern, you're looking at the surface pattern, and, the, and we have to know what the vascular pattern is in different part of uh, the GI tract, what the surface pattern is. For example, in stomach, you have pits. In colon, you have pit. Dodenum, you have villi. In esophagus, there is a flat surface because of the stratified squamous epithelium. So we need to be aware of the patterns in different parts of GI tract to, to identify, to assess an area and also to identify a lesion. So this is a quick video just to show the steps of doing an NBI assessment. So we always begin with doing a good cleaning of the mucosa. So always remember whether you're doing a white light endoscopy or any endoscopy, to clean the mucous surface of all the debris properly. And then start with a white light examination. Do not jump to NBI straight. You always start with a white light examination, do a good white light examination of that area, and then you have to then proceed to a NBI. So washing, doing a white light examination, then you switch to narrow band imaging mode. And then depending on the type of the instrument you have, if you have a near focus, you go closer. And then once you're closer, you can freeze the image. So this is very important to learn to freeze the image because once the image is frozen, then you can appreciate the pattern better compared to a moving image. The other thing, as you can see in this image, there's a cap at the end of the scope. And especially in the upper GI tract, when I do NBI, I use a cap because this cap helps me to get a very stable image. So again, washing the mucus, or, uh, mucus and debris of the surface, starting with a white light examination, then going to narrowband imaging. Once you're near focus mode, learn how to freeze the image so that you can appreciate the pattern properly. Then how do we report the findings of NBI. So when we're doing a narrowband imaging, then you have to also describe your findings actually. So this is what I do in my practice. You describe the appearance on a white light endoscopy, what like you do for a regular endoscopy per se. And then the abnormalities which you have picked up, those areas need to be described using the narrowband imaging findings. So you describe where the lesion is located, what is the extent of the lesion. Then as I said, the two important thing, the microvascular pattern and the microsurface pattern. So what is the microvascular pattern? in that abnormal area, what is a microsurface pattern in that abnormal area. And then as I'll be discussing in my presentation, there are different classifications for different lesions. And then you try to fit in your pattern which you observed into a classification if possible, which should be in most cases. And then finally, you have to give your interpretation. What do you think the lesion is? Is it a Barrett's with dysplasia? Is it an adenomatous polyp in the colon? Is it an early gastric cancer? So these are the main things, location and extent, so microvascular pattern, microsurface pattern, what is the classification, and then your own interpretation of the finding. So this was about a little bit about the NBI technology and how we go about doing NBI examination. 
And then we go on to the clinical application, which is the main emphasis of today's presentation. So for clinical application, we begin with uh, esophagus. So as I said that when you do NBA, you need to know what the pattern is in different part of GI tract. In esophagus, there is stratified squamous epithelium. So therefore, there is no pit. The surface appears flat. Okay. So therefore, you don't have to worry too much about the surface pattern in the body of esophagus. Now, moving on to the vascular pattern, there are two types of blood vessels you see. You see these deeper vessels. You can see these deep, thicker, greenish vessels with branches. These are the deeper vessels. They are not too, too much relevant for superficial lesion. What is most important in esophagus are these superficial vessels, which are called the IPCL or the intrapapillary capillary loop. So this is the key thing to assess for in the esophagus when you want to detect a superficial cancer, the IPCL or the intrapapillary capillary loop. Okay. So let's begin with a, a case scenario. So let's say you have a 65-year-old patient who has undergone therapy for pharyngeal cancer. And our patient is referred for upper GI endoscopy to screen for esophageal cancer. So we know that when you have a head and neck cancer, there is a higher risk of having esophageal cancer. And sometimes these patients are referred for surveillance. So if you're doing a surveillance to detect superficial cancer, can we do something to pick up lesion, more number of lesion than you can with a normal white light endoscopy? So there was this interesting study from Brazil, which had 129 patients with head and neck cancer. And these patients underwent surveillance endoscopy. And in this group of 129 patients, they found nine superficial cancers. Now, interestingly, only four were detected on white light endoscopy, whereas all nine of them were detected on narrowband imaging or iodine. So therefore, I think if our aim is to pick up a superficial lesion, we should use an image enhancement, whatever technology we have, uh, to, to pick up the lesions at an early stage. So how do you now identify a superficial esophageal cancer using a narrowband imaging? So the classification, as I told you, there are classifications for different lesions. The classification for esophageal cancer is called the IPCL classification. IPCL stands for intrapapillary capillary loop. So there are two things to look for when you are trying to do the IPCL thing. One is you look for an area formation. Usually, the area which has the cancerous change is brownish compared to the surrounding mucosa. And then in this area, which is brownish, you look at the IPCL pattern. So this is the IPCL classification. Again, we can't go into too much of details because we have to cover a lot of areas. But just to tell you that there are classifications in different areas. So for esophagus and IPCL classification, the IPCL is divided into five types. The type 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And 5 is subdivided into 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, and 5. The type 1 usually denotes the normal mucosa, normal appearance. In type 2 and 3, there may be some of inflammation. But once you come to type 4 and 5, that's where you start seeing a high-grade neoplasia or a cancer. So as you go down from 4 to 5, 1 to 5, 2 to 3, you start seeing high-grade neoplasia, cancer, and this cancer gets more and more deeper as you go down the route. So the main difference between the 4, 5, and the rest is that one is the vessels are very thick. You can see they are much thicker compared to what you see in the remaining. Second thing is, instead of being a simple loop like you see here, they start being like a petal of flower or like multiple petals of flower or branching. So the pattern gets irregular. The vessels become thicker in type 4 and 5. Now with the, with the endoscope, generally which we have, it may be difficult to sometimes distinguish 5, 1, 2, and 3. But if you can pick up a 4 and 5, to me, that is a job done because that means you have identified a high-grade neoplasia or a cancer. And then patient can subsequently be sort of subjected to appropriate therapy. So identifying a 4 or 5 pattern is key. And as you do more and more procedure with better equipment, then you can sort of subdivide them into 5, 1, 5, 2, or 5, 3. This is one of our patients. This is the appearance of esophagus on a white light. You don't see there's too much of change on a white light. But when you switch to NBI, you see there is a brownish color. There's an area formation. So this area looks different from the surrounding area. Now, in this area with, with brownish color, when we do a near focus, you can straight away see there is a type 5 pattern consistent with superficial esophageal cancer. Again, I'll run a short video. So this one, as you can see, we did a white light, then we went to the NBI examination. And then as you go closer to lesion, you can start appreciating this type five IPCL pattern in this patient, okay? Now here again, I'll just pause the image video. You just see that there is this area which has got brownish color compared to the surrounding area. And in this brownish area, you have a type five IPCL pattern. This again is an example of a superficial esophageal cancer. Now, in this patient, when we sprayed Lugol's iodine, you can straight away appreciate there is a large area which has not taken up uh, iodine. This is the area with the superficial 
cancer. So that was about superficial esophageal cancer. Next, we talk about Barrett's esophagus. So here again, I'll begin with the case scenario. A 60-year-old male patient with a previous diagnosis of Barrett's is scheduled for surveillance. Now, usually for surveillance, what do we do? We have the Seattle protocol where you take a four-quadrant biopsy every two centimeters. But the problem with this four-quadrant biopsy is that it only samples a very small area. And then there may be areas in between which have dysplasia which are not being sampled. So is there a technology by which we can actually look at the mucosa in detail and in real time say that this area looks dysplastic, I should biopsy from here, this area does not look dysplastic. So if you could identify dysplasia in real time, then you can take targeted biopsy and then you can improve the yield of dysplasia. And this is possible with image enhanced endoscopy like narrowband imaging. So how do we identify a Barrett's esophagus and dysplasia on NBI? In terms of pattern, no, Barrett's, the thing is, there is no one type of pattern for Barrett's. Barrett's, the surface pattern can be round. It can be a ridge pattern. It can be this uh, villus like, like this, uh, you know, this cerebriform pattern like the gyre of the brain. It can be a villus pattern. So you can have any type of pattern for a Barrett's esophagus. So therefore, for the primary diagnosis, you still depend on the biopsy to confirm it. To me, the main strength of NBI lies in, in, in surveillance in detecting dysplasia. So then how do you how do you diagnose a dysplasia using a NBI? So for this, again, there again we have a classification which is called the Bing classification, which stands for Barrett's International NBI Group Classification. This actually is a very simple classification. They look at the mucosal or surface pattern and the vascular pattern. Now, in the surface pattern, which is either circular or ridge or tubular, whatever the pattern is, if there is irregularity, you suspect dysplasia. Similarly, for vascular pattern, whatever the pattern is, if there is irregularity, you suspect dysplasia. And you don't have to have both of them. Even if surface is irregular or vascular is irregular, it's sufficient to suspect dysplasia. And this has about an 85% accuracy. And then that area, you should go and take a targeted biopsy. So again, I'll just run a small video, sort of just to show how do we assess esophagus barrets using uh, uh, NBI. So again, we begin with a white light examination to inspect the area properly, look for any nodularity, ulcer, depression, etc. And then we switch to the narrowband imaging mode. So begin with a white light examination, then switch to narrowband imaging mode. And once you have added localized the lesion, then you go near, go to the near focus mode, then inspect the entire area. So the key thing here is to inspect the entire area with barrets look at the pat surface pattern, look at the vascular pattern, and see if any area has any irregularity. So like, for example, in this case, everywhere the pattern seems quite regular, so there's no dysplasia in this particular case. But the key thing is starting with a white light, going to NBI mode, then examining the entire area thoroughly with your NBI. So this may need some time, so I think it's good to give the patient some sedation. And again, I think I must say the use of CAP is actually critical when you're assessing dysplasia, looking especially in the G junction, that area can be narrowed, and therefore, Cap is so, I think we should always use a cap when you're doing NBI, especially in the upper GI tract. So what does the literature say about the yield of NBI in Barrett's? Now, NBI has been shown to pick up more patients with dysplasia. It detects higher grades of dysplasia, and also it's been shown to require fewer biopsy samples. In fact, a meta-analysis has shown that the sensitivity to identify high-grade dysplasia is 91%, and specificity is 95%. So it's very good in picking up dysplasia in Barrett's. This is one of, uh, of our patients with Barrett. This is how it appeared on a white light examination. When we did NBI, we found that everywhere the pattern is regular. So in this situation, if you use a Bing classification, the surface pattern is regular, the vascular pattern is regular, so there is no dysplasia. But remember that NBI as of now is still not a substitute for four quadrant biopsy and still there's a recommendation that you should do a four quadrant biopsy. But in this case, with a regular pattern, you can take biopsy from anywhere you feel like because everywhere the pattern is similar. This is another of our patient here. This patient had a long segment Barrett's esophagus. This is what, how it appears on a white light examination. On NBI, what we can appreciate that there is one area here which has got this irregular vascular pattern. So therefore, in this patient, when we use NBI, then we know that I have to definitely take a biopsy from here. Whereas if you only had a white light endoscopy, you may have biopsy from this area, this area, and you may have missed this area. So that's where the strength of NBI lies, that it can tell you which area looks this plastic, and you can go and take a targeted biopsy. So that was about esophagus. We discussed about the IPCL for superficial esophageal cancer. We discussed about the Bing classification for Barrett's dysplasia. Now we move on to the stomach. So again, for stomach, 
before we can pick up an abnormality, we need to know what is a normal pattern in stomach. Now, in stomach, the pattern in body and antrum is slightly dif is, is different from the pat pattern in the antrum. So, in body, the pits are actually round. And surrounding these pits, you have this dark honeycomb-shaped structure. These are the vessels which are called the subepithelial capillary network. So, the micro vessels or the SCCN are in honeycomb pattern surrounding the round pits. And then you have this brown long structures with branches. These are called collecting venues. So you have round pits, you have honeycomb shaped microvasculature, and you have deeper this collecting venues. In the antrum, the pits are not round, but they are this wide structures are zigzag elongated, what is called as a reticulate pattern. The blood vessels, which are honeycomb pattern in the body and antrum, here they start getting coil shaped. You can see the brown structures are all looking like coils. And the collecting venules, which you see in the body of stomach, you don't see them in the antrum. So antrum has reticulate pits and it has coil-shaped vessels. So again, let's uh, talk about a case scenario. So let's say you have a 55-year-old patient who's come to you with dyspeptic symptoms. The patient does not have any alarm symptoms. His brother had gastric cancer at the age of 43 years. When this patient had a previous endoscopy, he was found to have extensive intestinal metaplasia. And he's been treated for H. pylori infection in the past. So here we have a patient actually who's got risk factors for gastric cancer. He's got extensive intestinal metaplasia. There is a family history of gastric cancer. He had H. pylori infection in the past. So now in this sort of patient, we know that he's got a high risk of developing cancer. So can we pick up lesion early? If we wait for this patient to develop symptoms, then it's usually late. So by the time the gastric cancer patients have symptoms, the tumor is at an advanced stage and, and most of them cannot undergo a curative resection. So in such a patient, if you come across can we detect cancer at an early stage? And now there are guidelines from the West and the European countries that when you have such a patient, they should be kept on a three-yearly surveillance program. And the surveillance should be preferably done with a high-definition or an image-enhanced endoscopy. So we'll discuss how we can detect early gastric cancer using narrowband image. So if we, if we remember the pathway of gastric cancer, it begins with H. pylori-associated gastritis, followed by atrophy. Then you have metaplasia, followed by dysplasia and cancer. So what are the changes which come across in somebody who has H. pylori infection? So I have just described what a normal appearance of stomach is on NBI. You have the round pits and you have this collecting venules. Now, one of the things which happens in H. pylori is that this collecting venule, this dark brown structures with branches which you see, they disappear. So this is one of the very sort of about 80 to 85 percent of cases with H. pylori will have this collecting venules missing. That's one feature which you see in H. pylori. So the white structure is still round. The honeycomb pattern is still maintained, but this dark brown longest uh, branching structures, they are not seen. The collecting venules are not seen. The second change which can come about is that instead of the pits being round, they can get elongated like the way you see it in the antrum. So these are the two features which you see in patients who have H. pylori infection. Now what happens in atrophy? When there is atrophy, then the pits are lost. And so therefore, in that area, you won't see a pit pattern. So for example, in this picture, you can see in some areas, you don't see any pit. Some areas, the pit pattern is intact. Some areas, you don't see any pit. These are the areas of atrophy where these are the normal areas. Now, what happens in intestinal metaplasia? Now, this is, in this, there are two main changes which come across. One of them is that the pit, I told you that in the body of stomach, the pit is round. In metaplasia, instead of round, the pit becomes elongated or tubulovular. So you can see in this picture, these white structures are elongated. They are more tubular. They are not round anymore. So that's the first thing. There is a change in the configuration or the morphology of the pit. Now, along with the change in configuration, you start seeing one, one line which is called as a light blue crest. This is a very important finding, very specific finding for intestinal metaplasia described by Dr. Wedo from Japan. So if you look at this picture here, you can see a fine line here, another line in this area, another line in this area. These, this line is what is called as a light blue crest. So when you see this line along this tubular elongated structure, then you're fairly sure that this patient has intestinal metaplasia. Next, we move on to gastric cancer. So again, there is a classification for gastric cancer. Like the same way we have for esophageal cancer, we have one for gastric cancer. And the classification, which is quite popular outside of Japan, is the VS classification, which is proposed by Dr. Yao from Japan. So V stands for vessel, S stands for surface. So to apply the VS classification, there are two things to do. First step is to look for a demarcation line. So what is the demarcation line? A demarcation line is basically an imaginary line which denotes that there is an abrupt change in pattern. 
So if you look at the pattern in this area, and this is an abrupt change of pattern. So when you have an abrupt change of pattern, then that area, that line is called as a demarcation line. So as you can see a change of pattern here, similarly there's an abrupt change of pattern from here to this area. So first step is to identify a, demarcated, a demarcation line. Now once you have identified a demarcation line, then within the demarcated area, you look for any irregularity of the vessel, which is V, or irregularity of surface, which is S. So if there is a demarcation line present, and in addition to that, within the demarcated, if you have irregular vessel or surface or both, either or both, if any of them are irregular or absent, then you are more than 90% sure that this patient has a gastric cancer. So again, I'll run a, a video from one of our patients. So here again, we begin with a white light. We clean the surface of mucus and debris. You can see one erythematous lesion on the white light examination. Okay. And then once we have done a white light, we switch to NBI and straight away, you can appreciate this irregular surface pattern here. The irregular looking surface pattern. The blood vessels in this area look quite irregular. Now you have to examine the entire lesion to get an idea about the extent of lesion and what the pattern in different areas is. So here again, you can appreciate this very irregular appearance or different, different shapes of surface. This is the demarcation line, easily seen normal area and abnormal area. And in that demarcated area, we're looking at the surface, which is very irregular. So this again fits into your description of a early gastric cancer by the VS classification. This is, uh, this is a picture again, if this is a white light image and an NBI image. On white light image, you can see one area which looks a bit pale. Now, if you're not very careful, you may pass it off as normal. But if you look carefully, there is an area which has got a pallor. And this area, when we apply narrowband imaging, straight away you can appreciate there is such a difference in this area compared to the surrounding area. So let's apply the VS classification for this. So the first criteria for gastric cancer is you should have a demarcation line. So here again, is there a demarcation line? There is, because if you see, look at this area, the pattern in this area, there is an abrupt change in pattern from here to here. So there is a demarcation line. Once you found a demarcation line, then you look at the demarcated area for any irregularity of vessel or surface or both. In this case, you can easily see there is an irregular vascular pattern in this area. So this is an example of early gastric cancer based on the VS classification. This again tells you the strength of this technology because if you didn't have an NBI in this case, probably you will call it as a pale mucosa. You can pass it off as normal also as well. So I think the patients who are high risk patients where you know the risk is high, probably if you want to really pick up cancer at a treatable and early stage, it's good to do an image enhanced endoscopy. But again, you can't do this for every patient with dyspepsia. So because you don't have so much of resources, it's time consuming, it's expensive. So you have to identify who is the patient who's going to benefit. So the case scenario I showed you here is a patient who would really benefit. There's no family history of gastric cancer, extensive metabolism. This sort of patient is one where we should subject to NBI, but not every patient at this stage. Now, what does the literature say about the yield of NBI compared to white light? And again, a systematic review and meta-analysis has clearly shown that the sensitivity and specificity of NBI is much better than white light in detecting early gastric cancer in Africa. Now, as we're running out of time, I'll just quickly go through colon. So we've covered esophagus where we had IPCL pattern for superficial cancer. We had the Bing classification for dysplasia and esophagus. Then we covered stomach where we looked at the, how, what changes come across with H. pylori, with metaplasia, and then how do we apply the VS classification for gastric cancer. So in colon, again, if you look at the normal pattern in colonic mucosa, it is somewhat like you see in the body of stomach. You have this round pits and the honeycomb-shaped blood vessels, but you don't see the collecting venules which you see in the body of stomach, actually. Now in colon, the main application is actually in characterizing a polypoid lesion in the colon. So let's say if you have a 55-year-old patient who's un who undergoes colonoscopy, and during colonoscopy, you find a three-centimeter sessile lesion. Now, what is the likely histology? Can you identify the histology? Can you predict that what is the likely? Is it an adenoma? Is it a carcinoma? Is it a hyperplastic lesion? And then how should we manage this patient? Does the patient need an EMR? Can the or patient requires an EST? Or should he be sent for surgery? If it's invasive cancer, it has to go for surgery. Superficial lesion can be treated with EMR or EST. Now, NBI helps us to make these sorts of predictions. It can help you to predict what is the underlying histology. And it can also help you make some treatment decisions about what should be the appropriate management strategy. So for again, for identifying a polyp, characterizing the polyp, what is the type of polyp, we again have classification. And the classification I find very helpful in colon is the kudos pit pattern. Now this pit pattern actually came in before NBI was into practice. This is mainly based on the surface, microsurface features, not on the vascular pattern. So kudos pit pattern divides the pits into 
five types. You have type one and two, which are round or stellate. They denote hyperplastic or non-neoplastic lesion. You have type three and four, which are elongates, white elongated or branching, so tubular or branch tubular structures. And then you have the type five, which is non-structural. So basically when you have round or stellate sort of appearance, it's hyperplastic or non-neoplastic. When these rounds, the white structures get elongated or they get branched, then it is adenomatous. And then when these are sort of non-structural, missing, amorphous, then you suspect invasive carcinoma. So for the, for the NBI classification for colonic, we have this classification called the NICE classification or the NBI International Colorectal Endoscopy Classification. Now this classification looks at three aspects of polyps. What is the color? What is the vascular pattern? And what is the surface pattern? And based on this, it divides them into type 1, which is hypoplastic, type 2, which is adenomatous, and type 3, which is a submucosal invasive cancer. The surface pattern which they have taken is similar to what it is for kudos pit pattern. So kudos type 1 and 2 fits into type 1. Kudos type 3 and 4 fits into type 2. And kudos type 5 fits into type 3. In terms of color, the type 1 or the hypoplastic are lighter or same colors background, whereas an adenoma or carcinoma is browner compared to the background mucosa. The vessels in type 1, you see, don't see much vessel. They'll be faint vessels, not very easy to see. Whereas in type 2, the brown structure, the vessels are very easy to see. You can see the brown structures of the vessels quite easily here compared to in type 1. And in type 3, there are disrupted or some areas you see vessels, some areas they're missing, some areas they can then be seen. Okay. This is how you classify a lesion based on NICE classification. One of the limitations of NICE classification is that the type 2 can include a low-grade dysplasia, a high-grade dysplasia, even a superficial cancer. So therefore, to overcome this limitation, this JNIT classification was, was suggested, where the two was split into type 2A, which is low-grade dysplasia, and 2B, which is high-grade dysplasia or even a superficial cancer. Again, because of lack of time, I can't go through the details, but these are easily available, and we can go through. So again, when you look at the differentiating power of NBI between neoplastic and non-neoplastic, the performance is very good. It's got 91% sensitivity and more than 80% specificity in differentiating neoplastic from non-neoplastic polyps. So again, I'll just run a quick video of a rectal polyp seen on NBI. So as I said, you always begin with a white light assessment, see the lesion, describe the findings, and then we can move to the narrowband imaging mode. So again, a polyp may have different pattern in different parts. So therefore, it's very important to examine all the areas of the polyp, actually, okay? So for example, like in this polyp, let's say if you look at uh, this area here, I think we'll just get the image in that area. So, so, so if you look at this area, you can see the, as I told you, if you think of the kudos pit pattern, the white structures here are elongated. Now, elongated white structure is kudos pattern three. And the brown, then the blood vessels are dark brown, they're easily visible. So easily visible dark brown vessels, the white structures are elongated. So this fits into the NICE 2 classification or JNIT 2A, which is an adenomatous lesion. Now let's look at another area in the same polyp. So this is one area which we have seen. Now if you look at a different area in the same polyp, let's look at this area. And we'll just freeze the image here. So here if you see, the white structures are still looking like elongated white type 3 or 4 but the blood vessels are quite irregular. So this is an area which has a high grade dysplasia. So you can see with NBI, you can real time see some part of polyp has got low grade dysplasia, some part of polyp has high grade dysplasia. And this is another example of a lesion. Again, this is how it appears on a white light. But when you do NBI examination, what you find is that you can't appreciate those white structures at all. So this is amorphous surface pattern. And these blood vessels, some areas you see them, some areas you don't see them. Again, some areas you see them. This is typical of an invasive cancer, how invasive cancer appears on NBI. The one area where NBI was a bit disappointing was in detection. People thought NBI is image enhancement. You'll pick up more colon polyps when you do a screening endoscopy. But somehow, when there was a screening, it didn't pick up more lesions than a white light endoscopy. But as time has gone by, as better scopes have come in, now it's clearer that if you use a newer equipment and if the colonoscopy preparation is very good, then NBI does help you in picking up more polyps compared to white light examination. So just last few slides, because I can't cover other applications, but just to tell you that there are a few other applications also which are emerging. One of them is that when you have somebody with ulcerative colitis, in these patients when you're doing a surveillance, one recommendation is a dye-spray chroma endoscopy, but you can also do an NBI and you can pick up a dysplastic lesion. Other is when you have a malabsorption with NBI, the villi can be easily seen as you can see in this picture. 
So when there is a villus atrophy, they are very easy to detect on NBR. When you're doing an EMR and EST, then you want to make sure that the margin is free of any lesion. So with NBR, you can actually assess if the margin is free of lesion. So in conclusion, what I presented is that image-enhanced endoscopy, it enables the assessment of mucosal surface in greater detail. It is better than white light in detecting lesions at an early stage. It has got a, it has already has an established role in detecting dysplasia and Barrett's early gastric cancer and characterizing polyps. One of the limitations is that it takes some time to understand and appreciate the patterns and there's a bit of a learning curve to it. But there's a lot of progress happening in the field of artificial intelligence and soon this will be there to help us and, may, and further use this technology for the benefit of our patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Amit, uh, for this wonderful uh, talk, beautiful pictures, beautiful videos. And it was uh, really a uh, very learning experience and uh, thanks a lot. And uh, <clears throat> to start the uh, ball rolling, I just want to ask you, do you require any uh, preparation for upper GI, like mucolytic agents, etc., to make uh, the visibility by NBA better? And uh, second aspect of that question is that uh, when you use a cap, you use caps that are EV caps, they are transparent, there are black caps, and also can you use additional water to enhance the image uh, uh, bigger, make it bigger? So okay. three aspects. Yeah, thank you, so the very, very important questions. So about using the additional thing to clear, so in my practice, I normally don't use because the 190 system which we have, Water jet is quite good to clear the area of things. So we sort of, but it, but it's, it can be done. So what I'm saying, it's no harm doing that. But in my practice, sort of, I use the water jet facility more often than using that one, actually. In terms of uh, cap, which you have asked, so I use the soft black cap, actually, the one which we have. And uh, I think with the cap, I think as I said, cap is actually essential to use it in the upper 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 GI tract, especially colon. I don't use cap that much, although, but in upper GI, it's critical, especially for the barracks, that area and G junction. If you don't use a cap, you will not get the image in focus that easily. So therefore, cap is very helpful. The one thing we take care is that when you're using a cap, we don't rub against the mucosa very hard, otherwise you'll get a ooze and that will hamper your field of vision. Underwater, again, I think in duodenum, I use it frequently when I use in duodenum. In other parts also, sometimes when you don't get a very stable image or there's a lot of things, underwater does help us in visualizing. But that I use more in duodenum. Rest of the area, sometimes I use underwater. I think in duodenum, it is very important. Yes. Especially even before MBA came, you know, people used to do insulin water in the duodenum to look yes. for picking up celiac disease and looking at the uh, villi and all this. Uh, actually, it really magnifies the images better. So I think that is a good one. And in colon, uh, why in colon caps are not used? Can be used, sir. I think colon, what I'm saying, if you look at the applications wise, the main application right now is characterizing the polyps of different types, actually. And there, I think you get a fairly good image, even if you're at some distance, because you're looking at this kudos type three and four. In fact, the kudos pattern is actually sufficient to tell you the type. The vascular pattern is additional information you are getting. So there, even if you don't have a fixed distance, you are able to appreciate. But Having said that, it can be used. It's just that uh, in colon, mainly it's characterizing and differentiating between different types of polyps, which you're able to do. But I guess maybe for a beginner, it's good to use. And if it's, But if it's like a flat lesion, very sessile, there it may be helpful to use a cap in colon. But otherwise, for elevated sessile lesion, we can get away without it. And many times in colon, we have elevated lesions or uh, even if they are sessile, they're actually a bit elevated or lateral spreading lesions. <laughs> Yeah. And it is not that difficult. And moreover, with the cap to go up to cecum also, sometimes it's difficult. So it's better. True, true, sir. True, sir. Very true. So in rectum, if you can, I think you can do it. And uh, and one more interesting thing which I noted that how do you document your findings when you do a uh, NBI? Do you have any assistant? I have seen in places there is an assistant he is writing it, and you take the pictures. And another is you know you take pictures and you finish the procedure and sit down and start writing. How do you do that? So, so what I do, so, so normally for me, like NBA usually is a, we have a priority in my mind most often the targeted examination. You know, we're going to look at something in the stomach or something in the esophagus. Like known case of Barrett's has come for a surveillance or somebody high risk of gastric cancer, you'd be looking for any early gastric cancer. Since I already know which part I'm going to examine beforehand in most patients, I just keep saving. I tell my assistant to keep saving images as I go. But I, because once I save the images, I'll be able to recall what I have seen from the areas because it's the area which has got abnormality which I'm more interested in. And so I will see which area that is. I'll see pictures from that area. And then after that, I will describe that finding. So it's not very difficult if you're doing a focused or targeted examination of one or two areas. But generally, if you're looking at the entire track, then you may have to probably, you know, real-time document. Otherwise, you will forget what you saw. 
But if it's a focus small area examination, just saving pictures and doing later is also okay. Sir, what I do in my, in my practice. Sir. And uh, one more thing, <clears throat> when you do an upper G endoscopy, even if it is a high risk patient, yes. how do you find out in white light what are the areas which you need to look at? Because so, you know, so, in white light, sometimes areas may be very subtle. And or when you put a narrow vent into a wider area, is there any area which you should, which you, is there anything which can tell you that you should see these areas? That's again very important point, sir. So actually, last four or five years now, I have been starting doing using this NBA for my patients who are having extensive metaplasia. Earlier, we didn't, because that's one group, if you're doing an endoscopy and you're picking up metaplasia and already they are known to have it, I'm putting them on a three early. There is a, it's not for everybody in the department, but patients which I see, I'm doing that procedure. So what I do is when I do this patient surveillance for a gastric cancer, I will first do a white light assessment, look for any subtle change in color. They may be in like one case showed an erythema, one case had a pallor actually. So there's a subtle change of color. In those areas, you can do a targeted assessment with NBA where there's a change in color or there's erythema or there is some depressed area, some nodularity. If you see those subtle lesions, you do a focused examination. And once I have done a white light and targeted examination of abnormality on a white light with NBI, then I do an NBI scanning of the entire stomach, which is possible. If you do more procedures, you should be able, even though people talk about illumination, but if you go closer to the surface, the illumination is quite good with the 190 system. You can look at the stomach in detail. To your question about the which side, so one area which you should look more carefully is that lesser curve area. I think that's area, lesser curve and incisura, those areas where you tend to see a lesion a bit more often than the other areas, actually. And that area also sometimes in the normal, you may not even, your scope may not be head on looking at that particular area and sometimes you may miss. So retroflexion may be a good position also to examine some areas in endoscopy. So a white light, picking up a suspicious area, doing a targeted examination, and then one general scanning with NBI, Going closer, it takes about eight to nine minutes to do this. Uh, is what I would say in my practice. Agreed, just for stomach, yes, sir. I, just I, for stomach, it takes. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I think it is very important to do a very good, proper wide light examination, and you should be your eyes should be very careful in looking at that. The mucosa should be clean, and you should actually use uh, liberally the washing uh, the water jet, and the 190 is very good for that. I also have noticed that, you know, uh, when you use a narrowband imaging, this is actually, it's taught to me in the past when I started doing uh, NBA many years back. Uh, when you see a black area or a brown area on a narrowband imaging, then you should go and see that area. Do you think that is right? So, in the stomach, the thing is, uh, what I mean, this may be it's like you're screening. You know, when you screen, you'll pick up, a lot of alarms will come. Some areas will be okay, some areas will be having a lesion. So when there is an inflammation in the stomach, when there's a congestion, inflammation will become dark because of the more blood flow. So even in a gastritis with inflammation, you will have dark appearing areas, especially in the antrum, you see this antral erythema and all, you'll be having dark appearance. But what that tells you that that area, you should go with NBI and examine. And when you do NBI, you find the pattern is exactly the same in a normal, but the vessels are very dark. So that is just inflammation. It is not conforming to any cancer or any metaplasia. So therefore that just red flags you to examine it properly. With NBI, it's quite easy to differentiate just a con uh, ingest uh, congested inflamed area from a malignant area or a metaphysics. There is a question by Dr. Bilal Ahmad uh, from Kuchin, and uh, he has asked question, there is a wasp classification of colonic polyps which incorporate nice in it, and it is worth to consider uh, to describe the polyp. So kindly comment on that. No, that's a very good. In fact, I had a slide, but then because the time was you not know, such a big area to cover the GI tract, I had a slide and then I deleted towards uh, today morning, you know, because I was not somehow this thing. So actually, that's a very good question. See, the thing with nice classification of JNIT is that the type 1 lesion they are calling, that is hyperplastic. But this lesion, which is sessile serrated adenoma, also appears like type 1. Then we know that SSA has a potential for malignancy, whereas hyperplastic per se doesn't have too much of malignancy. So we have to differentiate the sessile a serrated adenoma from a true hyperplastic lesion. So now people are coming up with some classification and one of them is the wasp classification. You look at the clouded surface, irregular border, the margin. So there are some three features you look at in the wasp classification. And if you have those classifications out of the four, there are four features have been described. If you have two features to suspect, but then that classification has come from just one group in Europe. It still has to be validated in a larger group. So as of now, it can just be a thing. And that's the reason why when you come across a type 1 lesion in, say, except for the rectum where very the SSAs are not very common, in the rest of the colon, if you see even a type 1 lesion, we still biopsy, we still remove them because they can still be an SSA. I think the main benefit of NBI probably is in that type 2 and 3 where you should leave alone for a cancer and or do an EMR on ESD. But type 1, because of the SSA, 
we still remove whether it's a uh, in the if except for the rectum sometimes we leave otherwise we tend to remove all the type one lesions as well there are three more questions and you quickly go through that and uh, one is that artificial intelligence is it available now for nba based diagnosis and uh, is, uh, uh, is there a real difference between using nba versus chroma endoscopy Yeah. So, so for artificial intelligence right now, I think what is ready for prime time is the colon polyp detection with the white light, which I think is now coming up. NBI, I would say, is still a work in progress. I think for the NBI thing, but for the colonic polyp per se, the AI is available. So maybe that AI can tell you that there is a polyp, and then you can go with NBI and you can at least look at that area and characterize the polyp. But for picking per se, I think it's a work in progress uh, right now for this. So, what was the second question, sir? The second. Chromo uh... endoscopy versus. Yeah. So chroma endoscopy. The thing with chroma endoscopy is chroma endoscopy. The dice. What I assume when you say chroma, probably they mean a dice free chroma endoscopy. Because NBI is also form of chroma endoscopy. NBI is called digital chroma endoscopy, and the other one is a dice free. In the dice free chroma endoscopy, you are looking mainly at the surface pattern. You don't assess the vascular pattern. Whereas with NBI, you assess both the surface pattern and the vascular pattern. So there is an added benefit, especially in early gastric cancer or anything other lesions. I think a vascular pattern assessment is quite important. So therefore. NBI probably has this added benefit of looking at the vascular pattern, which a dye spray does not help you with. Yes, I agree. I think you know because and uh, if you want to study a wider area with uh, dye, it becomes more messy and it becomes difficult sometimes. So chroma endoscopy has definitely advantages because you look at two things: the vessels and the surface pattern. <coughs> and also, so once you have sprayed, you can switch back to the normal mode. Where NBI, you can with a press a button, you can go to normal mode, digital mode. And once, you, once you spray the contra uh, dye, then you cannot switch back. Switch it back, you know. But you can do comment. I mean, in uh, NBI, you can do that. And uh, artificial intelligence is available with endocytoscopy, but it is going to come uh, uh, in uh, conventional NBI. But you know, people incorporate NBI also in endocytoscopy. So we can for vascular pattern, you can use artificial intelligence. That I am sure it is going to come. And another question is by Ishwar Murthy uh, about uh, difference between gastropathy and gastritis in NBI. Yeah, again, I tell there's not much of literature on that because NBI is mainly focused on picking up neoplasia and pre-neoplastic lesions. This gastropathy and all, so they will be just having some changes in the vasculature. There'll be more dense sort of you know more blood flow, darker areas. But there's no literature about how to differentiate a vas vasculopathy from this thing. Yeah, Any comment you want to make, sir, on this? I there's, there's nothing from what I'm aware of actually. Yeah, this is actually NBA. People should realize it is for a diagnosis yeah. of neoplasm or a pre-neoplasm. Yes, yes. And uh, of course, we have we have pick 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 up in intestinal metaplasia for H. pylori and also for uh, celiac disease in the duodenum. These are all different things now, but it's basically intended for looking at the vascular pattern and the cellular, I mean, and the mucosal pattern. So it, that is very important. And okay. another thing is that uh, a comparison between uh, uh, AFI and other endoscopy systems, uh, image enhancing techniques. What do you? Just, this could be the last question, and uh, I, I can see that the organizer is standing in the. Uh, even looking at me. <laughs> so AFI, to tell you the truth, AFI came in with a bit of a promise initially, but as time has gone, now we are not hearing too much about AFI because the NBI with the 190 system and the newer ones, I think it's giving a lot of information. So probably, if you look at the current thing, literature actually has come down in terms of the AFI, and there's not too much of comparison because AFI tells you different thing from what an NBI. NBI maybe is a part of it, you know. So therefore, I think off late, we don't talk too much about that, and I think you do NBI or any other form of enhancement is what is more important. I think uh, Tahir Majid uh, question is answered for you, and uh, there are so many new techniques uh, coming up. Uh, of course, this area is a very vast area, and it's going to be increased, and it's going to be enhanced as well. And uh, to finish everything in uh, 30 minutes is practically impossible. Colon itself is a big topic, and I appreciate and thank you for being very simple and uh, clear-cut uh, discussion on, especially on the upper GI. You have elaborated it very well, and uh, people could understand it very well. And Colin, you you gave us a brief idea that is enough for us. But maybe at some point of time, we can have one more discussion on the colon because it is a very important area. So back to the organizers, and I would appreciate and thank you for the thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this in, important learning process. I learned a lot. Thanks, Usha, and uh, all the organizers of uh, e-partashala. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthew Phillips, for conducting this session so well, and thanks, Dr. Amit, for a very clear and lucid presentation on NBI. I agree, yeah. this whole topic would itself have taken one hour, but I think it is just a way to stimulate our postgraduates to know the potential of NBI.